Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. It's a Thursday afternoon, which means I am delighted to be rejoined by John Paul Mason. We've got a, quite a bit to catch up on, JP. Um, how's your mm. week been? How's your week been? Uh, it was a bit manic last week. Sorry, I couldn't be on last week. I had, um, well, unfortunately, I had a funeral to attend. Um, a great guy that worked at, uh, in the security for, for Mad Crew. His name is Al McMenemy and there was a huge turnout for his for his funeral from people all over the kind of music and venue world in, in Glasgow. Everybody knew him, so it was really sad to to, to go to that. Um, and then just loads of loads of gigs, <laughs> loads of gigs. Like working them, and then I would, you'd think I would want a night in, but when Liam Gallagher and John Squire are playing the bar band, you can't miss that. So unless you're me, and then you can miss it, JP, because I couldn't get a ticket. Um... I remember speaking. Uh, I paid for me. Just, just to be clear, I oh, paid yeah. for me. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, um, I was speaking to a friend of mine, a musician who you are aware of. Uh, used to be in the stairs. In fact, they're they're touring soon. Edgar, Edgar Jones, Edgar Summertime Jones, and he said back in the day he got his first record deal the end of the eighties, the beginning of the nineties after the Laz had the big hit with "There She Goes." He actually played bass guitar in the Laz. And he said back then you would tour to promote an album, but now you release an album to promote a tour. He says the whole music world's turned on its head. So the chances of getting a ticket at the barras were slim to none. Bought the album, got the pre-sale code, still didn't get a ticket. Um, and I was just hoping that, that someone would offer something leading into it. You know, someone said, oh, by the way, they can't make it. Didn't happen. I've been watching the videos all morning. Yes, it is music. Sorry, guys and girls who are tuning in. JP and I will be talking about Celtic. I do remember, though, before we move on to that, Squire walking on the stage at the Barrowlands back in 97. They, they went to the Barrows twice, the Seahorses, and he was wearing a Scotland jersey, number four, and we later found out it was given to him, it was gifted by Christian Daly, who was all right until that well, he Was he not into playing music as well? He played guitar and stuff, I'm sure yes. he did. Yes, yeah. yeah. Ah, he was all right until he signed for Rangers at about the age of 38. Um, we are going to be talking about Celtic. JP, what has been your thoughts over well, the last couple of weeks? Obviously, one defeat, one win. Um, Hearts beat us 2 nothing at uh, Tynecastle, and we followed that up with a decent result, um, although the performance was questionable against Livingston. Are we getting there? Because, as, as the tagline says, we have been waiting all season for things to click. We've, been, we've had a few false dawns this season, haven't we? I, I mean, I'm still raging about the Tynecastle result <laughs> or, or the, the, the display. Um, I, I've, it's ruled out another bar that I, I can't watch games in now. So uh, apologies to Connolly's in the Merchant City. <laughs> I won't be back to watch a game there because if I see Celtic lose a game... Superstition? 100%, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I get there's that. A, totally. There's a, few, there's a few being ruled out. Um, but I, I just still so annoyed because... You're going into that game off the back of a seven-one win, and finally we had momentum, and the mem the momentum was taken out of our sails uh, straight away in that game. Fifteen minutes, red card, and yes, some people were still making the argument that we should have done better with ten men, but it's a hard place to go. Hearts hate us. Let's not make any bones about it. You saw the reaction to uh, any posts that were put up about the refereeing display or the VAR display was met with joy and delight from from their ends. So from that perspective as well, it was just like it was the, the worst one of the it was the second worst place you could go and get beat mm -hmm. after uh, after winning seven one, every seven different goal scorers, everyone on a high, you know, seeing what the team can do to a to a team that's you know Dundee, okay, they're not they're not Real Madrid, um, but they're a half-decent team in this league and they've given us problems before and we just absolutely dismantled them. And it wasn't because they got a red card or anything like that. It was just, you know, great football, great goals. So then you go into Tencastle, lose that and lose an inform or starting to be informed winger and in Yang for the next game. Yeah. And I just couldn't wait. For that game on Sunday uh, against Livingston, I just wanted to get to the game because obviously I couldn't get to Tynecastle. Get to the game and then and see the team. And I thought that the, the I, I don't I don't know if Brendan Rodgers mentioned this, but I thought that the, the the fans as a whole on Sunday were 
generally quite patient, which I was pleased about because when it goes one each, you know, there's a potential there for people to get a wee bit worried. And again, when it went two each, but the the fans as a whole didn't they didn't turn and they didn't get I didn't really feel that kind of nervousness. It felt mm. like they trusted the team to get the job done. And we'd seen enough in the game to know that that was possible. But you've also got that fear of them bringing on, that's something it was Alan Morrison said, of bringing on another basketball player uh, to go up front and then all you need is a punt into the box and could have gone the other way. <laughs> Despite our XG and all the... Uh, the data that, that that stacked up in our favour from that game, but yeah, it was um, maybe not the best performance, but crucial to get through, and crucial to just keep the the, the momentum going because we need it. <laughs> As your tagline says, we we need it. We do, we do need it. Uh, JP, I'm glad you clarified that it was a superstitious reason for not going back to Conley's rather than you've kicked off and. Oh no, no. <laughs> No. I could never imagine you doing that, JP. You're not that type of person. Um, but with, with regards to, you were talking there about Tynecastle and the fact, obviously, that we are despised, we're hated by that fan base, that club even. I mean, they don't even let our fans in anymore, which is becoming something of a, a trend in Scottish football. Scottish football will eat itself, and hopefully by that time, Celtic have found some way of playing their football elsewhere because it, it feels as though we're not wanted in this, in this uh, country. <laughs> Never mind uh, in this football league, JP. I mean, that's what it feels like. It feels as though, right, we've got an industry here that um, was affected like the industry you're you're involved in, massively affected during the COVID. And you were thinking to yourself, there were going to be clubs, there was going to be teams going out of, out of business due to the fact that um, they were affected uh, so badly um, during the, the COVID years. And I think that, you know, that they've come out the other end and teams are now, I don't know, I'm not I'm even going to say they're biting the hand that feeds them, but, you know, let's be honest, Celtic bring a, a huge amount to the Scottish game in terms of the broadcasting deal. What kind of broadcasting deal would you get if Celtic weren't in the league? What kind of sponsorship deals would you get if Celtic weren't in the league? That's all forgotten about. And then they, they treat us almost as, as if we're second-class citizens, as football fans, JP. They don't want you in the stadium. The, the ticket allocation, Patrick McGill yesterday said it's almost... Pointless. It's almost pointless having fans there. Um, I know you would bite somebody's hand off if they offered you a ticket, JP, but that is the sense I'm getting here. And social media is a beast. It's an absolute beast. It's something that I don't think can be tamed. There's some great things that can happen through social media. That's how I met you. You and I, we met on Twitter. Um, proper love story, that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of bad negativity around social media. And after a game like that, where we never we never kicked off after the game, um, we were looking at it like you said there, whereby you you were kind of playing the game with one hand tied behind your back. Yeah, I, I would have hoped that we did better. I don't think it was just the performance. So we spoke a lot about um, the the performance of the officials, etc. And I wasn't too disheartened, um, particularly after it coming after the, the Dundee game, which I think I wrongly said was six one yesterday. You're right, it was seven one. But this season does feel like. You're on a very, very steep hill and you're using that clutch control constantly going up this hill, JP. And every so often having to stop and it's getting started again. And that's how it feels as, as a Celtic fan for me this season. And how often have we sat here and said, this is the week, you know, it's almost as if you're, you're wanting, I think it was you that said that, you, you need a, a cough just to get the thing going again. And it stops start Jekyll and Hyde topsy turvy up and down. That's the type of season we've had. But I've got the sense now that, particularly the two games before the Rangers game at Ibrox, this is it. There's no more opportunities going to come our way. We need to just nail it now. It's now or never. There's another wee musical reference as well, JP. Do you get that sense? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we've got a home game on Saturday to, to put ourselves back on top of the league. I mean, we can do it on Saturday. We can go back in the top of the league, uh, albeit having played the game more. Um, but I think psychologically, to 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 get back on top, a place that we're used to being. Let's not let's not uh, get ourselves on. We are used to being top of the league. So, and I don't think that's entitled or anything else. It's just because we've been the best team for 
over 10 years, bar one season where well, we know what happened there. But um, I, I mean, Saturday, obviously, you're wondering who's going to be coming back into the team. There's the doubts over Carter Vickers, but they seem to have been uh, kind of quashed a little bit, I think. Yesterday I read an article, I don't know if that's if he's going to play on Saturday or not, or if they're going to leave him out on Saturday and keep him wrapped up in cotton wool for, for, the, for the next game. Um, but, uh, yeah, because we've got, what, we've got Livingston away. Livy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which game would you rather? I mean, I, I don't know if we have rushed him back, because obviously he's broken down since the original injury kept him out of the, the tail end of last season. Remember he played that brilliant match against Rangers, then he was kind of put out to grass, missed mm -hmm. the Scottish Cup final. We were able to wrap up the treble without him. But he came back in this season again, like the team for Garter Vickers has been stop start. And you start wor worrying a bit that if you bring him back too soon, even one game too soon, JP, he could break down again. We need him for the rest of the season. You hope that you've got enough to beat St. Johnson without him at home. You certainly do, yeah. And um, if there's potential injury to Welsh, Brendan Rogers is going to be. Uh, forced into playing a guy that he seems to have done his best not to play. But if we do have to play Lager Bielka on Saturday, then it does finally justify in <laughs> mid March the decision not to let him leave in January. Because mm -hmm. for the last month and a half, everybody's been kind of like, could have probably got away with letting him go on loan and playing football regularly. But this is the scenario where obviously they looked at it and went, Carter Vickers is touch and go. We can't guarantee him to play every single game. Um, Welsh is well known to have had injuries. <laughs> it's, it's not as if he's been 100% um, fit for his entire Celtic career. He's been unlucky, I think, with his injuries rather than any, any other thing. But still, we know that he's not really available. So that just like that leaves Liam Scales, which and Liam Scales seems to have become the the latest sort of whipping boy of sorts. I don't know if it's universal, but like this, the things that I hear are like, Liam Scales isn't good enough, needs to not play anymore. Navrochke is obviously injured as well. So um, you're, you're, you're kind of left with not much more than Liam Scales at this moment. Um, so if it's Scales and Lager Bielka, then so be it. But everybody else needs to to protect them as much as possible and that, and that means you need a big performance from the midfield. And you do, you do. Yeah. See, the only other option I think we've got at the moment, other than the ones you've mentioned there, um, Alistair Johnson can play right side of centre-half. He can mm. play there. He's played there. I'm not sure if he's played there for his country, but he certainly played there prior to coming to Celtic. Um, people then might have concerns about Tony Rouse, and I don't. I think that as an overlapping... Um, right back against any opposition in the league, he's, I think he's proven good enough. He's proven himself good enough. It's not like you're throwing Burnaby into the team, JP. Burnaby, mm. who can't can't even catch a connecting flight in Amsterdam to go and make his debut. The sooner he leaves the club, the better. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't see there being a problem. I think that you've got the physicality of Johnston. Um, how good is he in the air? We've probably not seen that as much as we would if he played more centrally. And on the right-hand side, I would have no concerns with Tony Ralston playing it. I don't know. Um, Brennan Rogers actually said, in terms of Burnaby leaving the club, he name-checked Liam Scales, JP. So it's quite clear mm. in his mind that the backup left-back is Liam Scales. Um, yeah. It's not Tony Ralston playing out of position. Um, and it's not Mitchell Frame, who obviously has disappeared. I think he might have suffered an injury himself. What have I missed regarding Neil Lennon? Right, Danny Boy, we'll be talking about that as well. I really did want to bring it up. Obviously, uh, Neil Lennon's son, Gallagher Lennon, mm -hmm. going back to last night, uh, Liam Gallagher's son um, is Lennon Gallagher. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> Gallagher Lennon is a player for St. Mirren. Uh, by the way, if, if there's any um, interference on what my voice, let me know in the comment section. Uh, it might be just my earphones or JP's earphones. Let me know. Uh, it could just be the earphones um, themselves. So let me know if there's any scratching going on there. And, um, yeah, so he's playing for Dumbarton and a member of the staff. JP, you read the story? A member of the staff? No, I don't know anything about it. So 
I don't know. He's been named in, in the usual places, but not officially. Um, WhatsApp, that is. The WhatsApp mm. rumour mill. Um, shouted at the, the youngster, whose mother was at the game. Tell me your address so I can get some bullets sent in the post. I'm paraphrasing, but that, that was basically what he shouted. It's been reported wow. in the press. It's being investigated. There's been a statement from Dumbarton. Um, and I remember a couple of weeks ago, there was a bit of a, a to and fro in between John Hartson and Mark uh, Benstead, John Hartson and Mark, Mark Benstead on Twitter, because uh, Benstead was kind of like fanning the flames of Neil Lennon's son being a footballer. And Hartson came on and said, I don't think you need to do that. I think you've got to, you know, regard this player on his own merits. Don't bring his father into it. Don't bring that, that whole, you know, saga into it. What his dad has gone through is enough. Uh, for one family for an eternity. Don't start talking like that when it comes to a young footballer trying to make their way in the game. But that's happened. That's happened at the weekend there. And that's there's an internal cool. investigation. And again, it's just it's it's ridiculous, JP. And Danny Boy's obviously um hearing some of the, the stuff that's been chatted about, but that's what's happened. And if it's a club employee, even worse. But anybody behaving in that that way, um mm. they need a stadium ban. That's what they need. He's just a wee guy, right? Like he's only like seven. Yeah, seven. yeah, yeah. Just a kid. That's a uh, weird behaviour. Uh, most certainly weird behaviour. But but talking of weird behaviour, you mentioned it, and I don't want to move on until I, I pick up on what I was saying there about the Hearts, the Hearts fans. Um, I've got many many Hearts fans in my street. Um, I've got a few friends who are jambos, and I don't have an issue with any of them. But online, wow. I think you get the worst dregs of society on 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 uh, X. I don't know if it's a a good cross section of a fan base. I don't know, JP. Is it? Does it? Does it? Do you think it reflects the actual views and opinions of of a certain fan base? Well, it's not until a uh, tweet or whatever gets jumped on and then it gets re retweeted and liked and everything else that, that that obviously someone then gets their validation for whatever they've said, you know, about about the game or whatever. But I mean, it's when Kenny Miller, Chris Boyd, Neil McCann are all coming out condemning those decisions, and the man, and our manager now is is going to be hauled up in front of the the beaks, <laughs> the SFA, um, for for sharing the exact same opinion. It seems absurd, um, really, that that that's that's the case because how are they going to sit there with a straight face and watch that back with Brendan Rodgers and and try and justify both? Both, I mean, and you can throw probably Celtic's penalty into it as well. Um, well, see, for fairness, for fairness, mm -hmm. let's throw Celtic's penalty into it because I, I think you know you you try to be as balanced as possible. I, my my take on it at the time, JP, was it was soft, but it was a penalty. Somebody was arguing with me online saying that Shankland was only millimeters offside. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, okay, so you've answered your own question. He was offside. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter <laughs> how, how how much the margins are. I thought. I thought the Yang penalty was a penalty. Am I am I watching that through green tinted specs? I thought it was soft, mm -hmm. but it's a penalty. What do you reckon? I've not watched it as many. Well, I've not watched any of it back as much as I, I did at the time. I just saw it, saw what I saw at the time. I didn't really want to put myself through the the anguish of watching it all again. But um, it just looked like a, a coming together in the box, which you have obviously seen those penalties given. I mean, look at the penalty Hearts got against Hibs. I mean, that yeah. was never, did you see that? It was never a penalty in a million years. And they got that midweek. And then you had Alan Preston and BBC Sports Sound going on about how great Hearts were against Celtic and that. And like, ah, they've had a difficult week, you know, they got uh, well beaten at Ibrox last weekend. And then, you know, they were fortunate midweek. I mean, Hibs should have beat them midweek. Mm -hmm. And then we're coming at that ground on Sunday after a 7-1 victory. For, uh, you know, Fully confidence, and it's taken away from us uh, pretty brutally as well. I mean, it's, I mean, you, when it went to Dermot Gallagher and Sky, and he he said obviously he backed the referee and said that he thought it was a red card, and then they went over to the other two folk that were sitting, the guy and the girl that were they were the, the co panelists, and they were just like, never a red card for me. <laughs> how is that a red card? How, how can it be? How can it be a red card? That's I mean, G GP, the, the world's gone mad if that's a red card. We were talking about it um, extensively after the game. And um, the, the thing, again, that we pointed out was 
going back to Burnaby, uh, not to slag him off. Remember, he gave away the penalty against Dundee United, facing away, ball ricochets, mm. hits his arm. Um, and it spooked him, and he was hooked at half time. It actually affected the player because, you know, it kind of knocked him off off track, if you like. Um, same kind of thing happened to Alwata. I felt the point was raised. And when you watch his performance, he wasn't, you know, for 20, 30 minutes after that, he was away with it. He wasn't he tuned into the game. He was giving the ball away. Of course, he gave the ball away for uh, Lauren Shacklin's uh, minimally offside goal. But, you know, I, th I think it is, um, in terms of a decision, it's the worst decision I've seen all season. It is the mm. worst decision I have seen all season long. And you try to, you do try to be balanced, but we are biased because we're Celtic fans. Um, and after a game, you add the emotion in there as well. So it's difficult. And then maybe as, as days progress and a week progresses, you can look at it with a fresh perspective. Um, but I still think it was the worst decision I've ever seen. Oh, it was brutal. But having said that, like Yang obviously was coming into a bit of form. Yeah. To the point that, you know, there was this pattern was Yang, are you in the Yang gang or whatever? And I'm, I'm like, hod, hod the bus. I'm not joining anybody's gang until they've got a, a league winner's medal in their hand I, or they've contributed to everybody getting a league winner. Big time. Absolutely. I mean, because we said that about Bernardo at the time. But it's weird sliding doors moments because Kuhn comes in against Livingston and actually looks because I mean everybody was saying that there's no way Kuhn can be as bad as as what has been put forward in his first few appearances, and then he comes in and has a good game. I mean, okay, it's against Livingston. We're not going to run away with ourselves because they're obviously a, a fairly low quality team in in this league and will probably be relegated. However. Mm -hmm. You need a performance like that for a player to convince himself that he can do it for this club and at that ground. So, if if the like the sort of uh, the if it, if that is the making of Kuhn, if he starts on Saturday, has another good game on Saturday, he's playing himself into contention to play against Rangers at Ibrox. Yes, he absolutely is. I mean, obviously, and, and, and would that have happened had he not got in to play? Because Yang would have probably, well, Yang would have definitely played against Livingston had he not been sent off against Hearts. So I don't know. It, it, it could it could turn out to be a positive. It doesn't feel like that at the moment. And I was watching the Morton Hearts game on Monday night, cheered every yellow card that Hearts got, and was willing them to be on the wrong end of a of a really bad decision that would knock them out of the cup. But they can, got you, that can you believe they've beaten us twice this season? No. Well, then the, the thing is as well, there was this other narrative. It was like, oh, you look, listen to these, you can't handle getting beat. You know, you can't win every week and look at the stages. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We got beat fair and square in December. I was at the game. Hearts came we, and did a number on us. Uh, absolutely. We did not deserve to win that game. Didn't deserve, to, didn't deserve a point. <laughs> and that was the game where I finally gave up on Mikey Johnson. And look what he's doing now. <laughs> uh, I mean, I did. I, I, like I said, I was pleased for him that he scored those goals against Dundee. I, but I did sit, think at the time that what he did next was not going to be probably at Celtic, and and well, it's working out for him, and I'm happy for him. But uh, no, I mean the the hearts the hearts game. How could you not be aggrieved <laughs> being on the end of a of a, a decision like that? I, I know. know it's it's I, poor. And the thing is, people go on about uh, get over it, etc., and all this stuff, but. To be fair, when you when you look back through the the live stream on Axom has been running for four seasons, um, and during the COVID season we were we were heavily critical of various aspects of the club from boardroom level right down to the players on the park. Um, Ange Postecoglou came in, three losses in six games uh, across all competitions, or was it four and eight? I'd need to double check that. Kind of blotted it out of my mind after he started winning. Um, and we started talking about Ange needs to step up. Doesn't have a doesn't have a kind of backup plan. Doesn't have a contingency. We started winning games. So I don't think that the rose tinted spectacles are always on JP. I think that very much so. If there's something to be criticised, if something's not working, we call it out. We call it out to Celtic fans because you want to be the best you can possibly be. And um, you know we don't kick off because we get beat. Because as you say, go and watch the game, uh, the, the post-match after the 2 nothing game at Celtic Park. We said how bad we were. But when you feel aggrieved due to other aspects and other factors in a game, that, that, that's no throwing the toys at the pram. I mean, that, that's a legitimate concern that was shared by the gaffer 
because he came out and said it after the game. It's, it's going to result in banning, blah, blah, blah. But uh, no, and, and that takes me right back to what I was what you said at the top of the show. Social media cesspit can be brilliant as well. I mean, what we do with regards to like uh, putting things out there, um, charitable aspect of it, and people get behind you and you really see the, the, the proper use of a platform like uh, Twitter. But yeah, you've got to put up with all the nonsense as well. But they're, they're as vehement. The Hearts fans were as vehement as the Rangers fans after that game. I mean, what they seem to forget, I'm talking about the Rangers fan base, is how poor they were against Motherwell. They're, they're, they've, they've created a new narrative that they were brilliant, they should have won the game 6-1 and all this, carry on. No, what that showed you, forget the Hearts game for a minute, that showed you that you can be got at, that showed you that uh, you're capable of dropping points against other teams even at home. Um, and that's something that's been lost in the chaos of us going to Tin Castle and getting beat, is the fact that, you know what, Motherwell went there First win in what a couple of decades. Mm. Uh, the last time they won there, Owen Coyle scored a double. You'll remember that. Owen Coyle <laughs> scored a double against them. So for me, that that's almost been lost. But I'm going to remember that because I think that between now and the end of the season, obviously we're going to have to step up, uh, not only against Rangers, but there are going to be times. Obviously, they're playing again tonight, two extra games in the last week that we've not had to play. I'd rather be in Europe, but listen, that's where we are. How's that going to affect them? And uh, I think it will. Now, a couple of wee points I want to bring in here. Music chat saved us during COVID. Yes, it did, Durban Culture. You're right. Schema Delica, uh, renamed Schema Celica. We had quite a few chats about music as well. Celtic and music go hand in hand. I'm, I'm genuinely a wee bit, con not concerned, but bemused by this one. Paul McLean, listen to yourself, PJ. You're embarrassing. Tell me what point you're referring to, and we can have a discussion about it. A way back to the 20th century with my views. Normally, I get told to go way back decades with my haircut and my style and uh, my, my choice of clothes, JP, but with my views, 20th century views. What views are you talking about, Paul? Let us know. And we'll talk about it. Um, Les Watts, PJ, PJ, sir, 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 please, sir. Sir, I think we'll beat St. Johnston, PJ. Uh, can I get a mention? 4 nothing to the hoops. Well, you just did, Les. There you go. And I've, I've mentioned you before, Liz. You're not one of these guys that I ignore. Uh, you're not out with the favourites. I've apparently got a wee hobby favourites, JP. So these are the things that people are saying. Paul McFarlane, you've been on two days running, Paul. You must be one of my favourites. Afternoon, John Paul and JP. Is the Celtic shot behind you from the 91-92 season? Love that top. I, I can oh, tell yeah. from this distance, oh, yeah, I can well, tell well, it's, well, an it's, well, it's, it's an original. It's an original because it's got a furry badge. Yeah. Am I right? Aye, aye, aye. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty rough on the other side, though, wasn't it? It's the aye, it's the shirt that we were wearing when I went to my first Old Firm game, as it was. 2-1, um, John Collins and Andy Payton. Andy Payton, yeah. yeah. Celtic Park, aye. It was, I, I just put it up because we were, you were talking about the the takeover, because like, like, it's 30 is it 30 years? It's 30 years, isn't it? 30 years, last Monday, yeah. Yeah, 30 years, yeah. JP. Absolutely frightening that it's that long ago. It is um, scary. It is scary. Still got that, all this stuff. Game. You, you are? The game? I'm going to grab something here, if it's still there. Mm -hmm. There's a tape, there's a cassette. You remember them VHSs? Big mm -hmm. plastic bit of kit. Where is it, man? It's there, right? I'll just uh, squeeze behind this monitor. There's your close-up. I've got this. I need, to, I need to give a shout-out to Jim Greenan. Right, here we go. A um, couple of comments, JP, have been slagging off my backdrop, right? Saying that it's through nonsense and junk and all that. And there's a few Rangers fans going on about it. And I'm like, would you rather there was wrestling belts there? I don't know what you expect. <laughs> right. Eventually, there's going to be uh, the Axon logo, maybe in a wee light box. It's a work in progress. But anyway, Jim Greenan gave me this, right? Now, I don't know if you can see that, right? Can you see that? Uh -huh. It's a homemade... Oh, look at that bit at the bottom. Nice wee message. Right, Celts for Change meeting at the Imperial Hotel in Dundalk. Does that say the 5th of February, 1994? Yeah. Right? So this is a VHS tape. Um, look at that. He's even stole it from the Spa. Look, the Spa Video Club. How retro is that? But this is a VHS tape, um, Celts for Change. And this is a meeting that he took his camcorder to and filmed. And it's never been seen by anybody. Right? Wow. So that was a Celts for Change meeting that happened in Ireland. Let me know in the comment section if you were at that meeting. The reason I've got it sitting on my desk here 
is I've got a wee set up with the old VHS recorder and a device that allows you to then digitise it. And we're going to stick it on the YouTube channel. I think that Amazing. would be... It's a piece of history. It's a piece yeah, of history. Totally. Um, and the, the Celts for Change guys who were there, uh, Brendan Sweeney and Mark McGlone and the boys, giving speeches, etc. You'll, you'll see people who you know, you'll see yourself. You might see dearly departed in the audience as well. Uh, JP, so there you go. I've not forgotten about you, Jim. I've still got your videos, mate. And that is one. That's a wee item of history. And you can see looking at the actual date there, that's like a month before the takeover. That's mm -hmm. a month before the takeover. And the Celts for Change guys were still over in Ireland, speaking to supporters groups and all that, JP, trying to get everybody in, get the buy-in, yeah, because we were pretty fractured back then as a fan base. Didn't no, really I, know what was happening. I was pleased to see that... Uh... No, it's obviously not a similar thing, but kind of is. But that meeting that happened at Gracie's, yeah, um, was like a coming together of everybody, so that we can have a voice <laughs> uh, within the club, mm -hmm. if if possible, if feasible. So like that was kind of my frustration that the whole sack the board chants that were coming out because it was just like just hollow. It was just a chant. Like you need you need something like that and on the ground movement if you want to make any sort of change. Um, at all, and obviously um, Jason Higgins and yeah. some of others have kind of decided that was the way forward, and uh, fair play to them. You need to be stabilised. I think that's one of the big things. We've got an email update, actually, from Jason at the Trust, um, which I just noticed popped into my inbox this morning. I'll have a read through that, and we'll probably talk about it tomorrow. But uh, on the subject of that jersey, I'm sure that was the game. You're right, Andy Payton scored, and he also got a, a knock to the head, big yes. gash yeah. to the napper. And that was in those days where they just had a big tubby Vaseline, I think, right? So nearly mocking would have just got a big hand for that and whacked it on his head. Maybe then just put a wee bit of bandage on him. On you go, son. You know, that, he, ended that up, was... he ended up covered in blood and chalk because, like, from the <laughs> from the, the penalty That's box right. markings and all that, he had like he was covered in like blood and chalk. And Mark Haley scored with like 12, 15 minutes to go or something, and it was a bit nervy, but it was. I mean, to go to go to my first game against them and see us win, especially in that time when it was so grim. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously the, the the victory at the end of the day meant nothing. It was nothing more than a than a token win. Um, one of those sort of wins that is good at the time, but you're sitting trophyless at the end of the season yeah. and didn't see us win a title. Didn't see us win a title until um, ninety eight. And didn't see us win a trophy until '95 from being eight years old. So, but again, you'll be called a, you'll be called a glory hunter as well, uh, JP. I, I savor what? every single trophy that we win, every what? single one. Got Celebrate you. it like it's the first, the first and the last. I mean, yeah. uh, what else was that game infamous for? What can you remember about that game after Andy Payton scored his goal? They were still all celebrating over the jungle and the referee allowed Rangers to kick off. And only oh, that's right. Tom Boyd and Pat Bonner were the only two Celtic players in on the field of play at mm -hmm. the time. And it was the mm -hmm. front page of the Celtic View the following week. It was just like, you're trying to let, let these guys score. Uh, mm -hmm. Unbelievable scenes. And probably, I'm, I'm, I'm saying probably the final Celtic jersey ever without a sponsor. I don't think we'll ever no. see that again, will we? Because was that bef that was after people's right? It was I one season after. I mean, we couldn't even the board were incapable of attracting a sponsor. What happened with that? This is the wee geeky bit, but it's going to lead on to something more modern. As the season before that was the exact same kit, but as JP says, we had people's Ford on it. The people's Ford um, was the brainchild of Terry Cassidy. And um, whilst I'm telling the story, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy who runs People's Ford because Brian Gilder, uh, I went and interviewed him for the book and he told me the whole story as to how he got involved. So he was sponsoring Celtic like on the billboards, but we had the long-standing agreement with Jerry Eady at uh, CR Smith and we had CR Smith for years and years. But as Terry Cassidy was very good at doing, he fell out with Jerry Eady <laughs> and he was like, right, okay, I'm not sponsoring you next season. He went to Brian Gilder. He got a one-year deal with Brian, who had been, as I say, sponsoring the boards. And Brian says, well, there's only one thing. The, the actual brand is red, white, and blue. And, and they, they actually put the Ford blue logo on the Celtic jersey without permission from Ford, right? Mm -hmm. 
So it's it's always a franchise, right? Mm -hmm. And they put that Ford sign on a Celtic jersey without Ford even knowing. And they got away with it. No question. But interesting enough, when I went up to interview him, he's changed the branding and it's now silver. But they were they were sticking to their guns. So Celtic had red, white, and blue on the on their jersey, which was horrific. But it reminds me, and I've got permission to read this out, JP, right? I mentioned last week that uh, one of the one of the guys on on the old um, Twitter. See, see, this is what social media is good for, right? I got a DM. Sorry for anybody that's DM me and I've not got back to it. I do have big sweeps every now and again and go through everybody's um, content, right? So I'm trying to find it now. Try to find it. There it is. So he, he shall remain anonymous, but he, he, we were talking about Terry Cassidy last week. He says, Paul, I wrote to Terry Cassidy. I wrote to him and he got back to me. Wait till I dig out the letter. So I, I, like, I was genuinely laughing when I was reading this, right? Because we were talking about, you know, being disenfranchised and, and like, um, not feeling as though the club and the fan base were on the same level and all that, JP, right? So the guy, he sent me this letter. It was the 28th of February, 1992, right? Mm -hmm. Dear Mr. X, this is from Terry Cassidy, signed. Listen to this. This is brilliant, right? <laughs> it's good of you to write outlining your opinions of the recent phone-in on Radio Clyde. I'm guessing Cassidy had appeared on Radio Clyde the week before. But I assure you, life is difficult enough without having to plough through 12 pages of the uninformed comment you sent. You... <laughs> this is from the chief executive of the club. This is like Peter Lowell writing to a fan, right? You do, of course, have a right to your opinion, and I respect your sincerity. <laughs> this is the best bit. Please continue in your efforts to get me removed from Celtic Park, but could you do so without bothering me? You're sincerely Terry Cassidy. Wow. It's a genuine letter. That's the contempt that he held for the Celtic fan base in 1992, which was the same time we wore that jersey that's behind you, JP. What, was he a Celtic fan? Cassidy. Right. Cassidy, Cassidy had no interest in Celtic until the day he got the job. Um, he obviously uh, was the first guy at Celtic to employ Peter Lovell. He brought mm. Peter Lovell to the club as a financial controller in the early 90s. Uh, Peter left and made his fame and fortune elsewhere before coming back after Seville. But that was a contempt for which Derek Cassidy held the, the Celtic fans in. I mean, it, it's bemusing. If I hadn't seen it with more eyes, but it's a genuine letter. It's mad that he took the time to write it, isn't it? I mean... I just had this like vision. You know, I'm walking about his office, and I'm guessing that he's got like a, a PA, and and he's dictating this message, having a wee grin, probably smoking a cigar at the time. You know, I, I'll, I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Unbelievable um, level of contempt for the Celtic fan base. JP was that? Yeah, I. I mean, it's, it's the changed days. Has it changed days? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, I wonder if anybody else out there has got has written. I mean, they definitely have. Surely, in this day and age, somebody else has been writing letters to to Peter Lowell or to Michael Nicholson or whoever. So I wonder if if, if there's any replies out there that are of a similar uh, level of content. I don't know. You know. Similar tone. I mean, I've told you before, uh, as geeky as I was in my youth uh, at that time, I wasn't writing to the chief executive for Celtic. I was writing to the managers and the players, and I've got two folders just over there full of replies from everybody from Lex Bailey to John Collins and Paul McStay and everybody in between. Uh, it was just incredible for the letters to drop through your post box, JP, right? And the excitement as a wee Celtic fan that they had literally written back to you. I'm talking handwritten letters to guys like Roy Aitken, David Pover. Unbelievable. I've got them all, as I say, stored away in a folder. Um, and the connection that you felt simply because they took the time to do that was was massive. I don't know what the, the situation is now with football clubs. I don't know how they deal with fan mail, as it would be called. I'm not sure. Mm. But I do remember a pal of mine, uh, Mikey became the general manager at Dunfermline Athletic, and he started reintroducing all these kind of retro aspects of the club, whereby he made sure that anybody that wrote to the club, all the letters were dealt with by a certain individual. They were all dealt with specifically if they wanted something signed, program, photographs, it all happens, all that kind of stuff. And it was great, mm. you know, because as I say, back then, JP, right, um, I don't think there was too many um, other distractions in terms of, 
you know, the, the devices that kids have these days are a massive distraction, not only because they're on them, but when they're on, for example, on YouTube or whatever they're doing, there's there's a huge um, kind of focus on the English Premier League uh, and on players, individual players who are brands over the world. Haaland, every kid knows who Haaland is and Messi and Ronaldo and all these types of player. And it's pulling you away from that traditional element of being born into a football club. So just that wee moment where you actually got a handwritten letter to Lex Bailey um, through the door with a signed photograph and all that, JP. And he's actually having a bit of crack with you in the letter. Phenomenal. I'll need to show you all that stuff. I, I just remember that just when you were talking about um, people knowing things around the world, I don't think I told you this, but when I was in the Louisville Slugger Museum in Louisville a couple of weeks ago, as part of the tour, you could like swing a bat that was that had been, you know, they had Babe Ruth's bat and they had all these other. I mean, obviously, my knowledge of baseball was limited, so I, I just asked for one that had been uh, used at Wrigley Field in Chicago because that's where they go in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So that's why I wanted to do that. But the guy, the old boy that was, um, that was, you know, taking the bats off the shelf and uh, was chatting to us, and he went, Oh, you're from Scotland, and he said, uh, Who's your who's your soccer teams then? Or who's your soccer team then? And Dave went, oh, I'm Rangers, he's the other the other lot. And uh, and then he straight away <laughs> forgot about him, forgot about Dave and just went, it's on my bucket list to go to a Champions League game at Celtic Park. And I went, what? Really? And he went, oh, absolutely. The guy's in his 60s, probably slim to none chance of it ever happening. I mean, he's got a... It's not cheap to fly from America to Scotland, I don't think, likewise the other way. Um and uh, yeah, he said, I, I remember you beating Barcelona. I said, I watched that game. And I'm like, this is mad. Like, I'm having a conversation with a guy about Celtic and Louisville, and he's telling me what. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking of all the Champions League games that I've been lucky to see, you know. I mean, not obviously that many great uh, moments in recent history, but thinking back to like beating Man United, beating Juventus. Yeah. Uh, beating AC Milan. AC Milan. It's it's like you say. It's the last sixteens that, or, or a big big result like the one against Barca, that spreads that world to a completely different audience. That yeah. word rather winning in Lisbon. I've spoken to people, JP, who were Celtic fans pre Lisbon, and they talk about. Well, Jim Moore actually talks about the fact that Celtic, in terms of a Scottish football club or a brand, if you like, or a Scottish football club that won a few trophies. That was it. He says, you know, we're just as successful as this or that. And, you know, the tribalism or within Scottish football, you might have thought it was important. But beyond these shores, it wasn't that important. And only when you started making the inroads in Europe, Lisbon was massive. That put you on the map. But we're not doing that enough. And I don't mean winning the Champions League. Having those moments, like that guy actually name-checked the Barcelona game 2012. I watched that game. He's watching that on the telly. He's watching. He's trying to soak up the atmosphere. He's thinking, "Wow, that needs to be part of." Like I, I'm going to say it. There's a there's a German film crew, a documentary team. They are making a, a documentary about uh, different derbies from all over the world, and they have selected Celtic versus Rangers as one of the games that they want to cover. And they're coming to speak to you and I in April. And it's a German film team, and it's like right. At some point during the planning of that GP, they would have said, right, what, what games are we covering? So they've already been over to Brazil, or sorry, I Brazil, Argentina. They've done some games down south, and now they're coming over to to, to check out our game. You know? I hope they're not expecting to get a ticket for Ibrox, because we're not getting any. So <laughs> Maybe that's only, maybe that's the only reason they've, they've contacted us. No, you're right. So we'll, we'll decide where to take them and all that kind of stuff and make sure um, that our contribution is as balanced as it possibly can be. But... It goes back to what you say, that brand. And the only way, I mean, again, people might think I'm being critical for the sake of it. The club has, have not gone out and created that brand worldwide. They can tell me anything. What have they done in all these different regions to create the brand? They've not done anything. Celtic fans have created the brand. And the, the diaspora who find themselves all over the world, they have spread the word. It's not the club. The club have not had a plan to say, right, we're going to go to Japan. You know, after Nakamura's success, we're going to go to Japan and we're really going to build this relationship that we have with our Japanese fans. No, Nakamura left the club and that was it until Ange mm. came, right? And then in that, that period, in the interim, nothing happened in Japan. We did not build our global fan base in Japan. We just didn't do it. So it is the fans that do it. 
hundred percent. There's no doubt about that. Um, there's quite a few other points I want to cover with you, JP, before we have a wee chat about the uh, the game at the weekend coming up. Um, you've mentioned Kuhn, and yet you're right. Yang at that point, first choice. Palmer's kind of out of the favour at the moment. He's injured, although he's still going on international duty. And then Kuhn comes in. He has a good game, so you're starting to look at him, considering him. And it, but after the game, Brendan Rodgers said something about James Forrest. Mm. And after that, I was thinking, you know, in the context of what he said, I mean, you can use the soundbite all you want, saying, oh, he's the best winger. He then backed that up and, and obviously gave you the context of what he, the point he was trying to make. Is he preparing us for Forrest starting against Rangers? I mean, that, that I think that all depends on Kuhn's performance on Saturday and against Livingston. I mean, how, if, if Kuhn plays well on Saturday, which obviously we're all hoping he does, then he keeps his jersey. Um, then there's an international break. Then there's Livingston away. I mean, that pitch is a, one of the worst ones that you could be playing on the week before <laughs> going to going to Ibrox. You know, in, in terms of especially when you're if you're playing guys that are carrying injuries or worried about getting an injury. Of all the pitches you're going to play on in this league, that's that and Kilmarnock are the two ones that you're like, oh no, because remember, uh, Jozo Simeonovic wouldn't get risked. Brendan Rodgers wouldn't play him on on the plastic pitch, and I'm sure there's one or two others as well that were always kind of held back from from that. So, but yeah, but Kuhn, if he plays well on Saturday, keeps his jersey, and then would, you can't drop him then for Ibrox. I mean, it would be pretty unfair to drop a guy who if he carries his form into the next two games. So, I mean, Maeda starts, I've said that from day dot this season, Maeda starts regardless. I was like so chuffed for him that he got that hat-trick. Um, can't believe it was his first. Well, no, he scored a hat-trick against Yokohama. Marino's yeah. didn't he? But in a competitive game, it was his first hat-trick. And he actually looked to have enjoyed it, you know, because there's, there's times that he's just like a, cold-blooded assassin after he scores it just looks like you know I don't know if it's if it's just the way he is or what but like he just sometimes doesn't look like he's had a good time scoring a goal but he definitely enjoyed those um on Sunday so I but Kuhn it's an interesting one with Kuhn because paid three million pound for him it's not it's not it's not a guy that's and he's doesn't he really come into the kind of Development player category, I wouldn't have thought. I mean, he's 24, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of think that he's well on his way to being the player that he's going to be for the next five, six years. Obviously, can be coached differently and everything else, but the basics of his game are there. So <laughs> he's either good or he's not. And we'll find out in the next few games if Livingston was a flash in the pan or if he has actually got the minerals for for what we need right now. And we only bought we only brought in two players in January when we really needed probably three or four. And the two that we've got in, he does contributed massively so far. Like Doug is out of games, annoying that he missed the penalty against Hearts, but it was his first penalty miss ever, I think. Mm. Um but Kuhn's the other one. So you, you kind of it's kind of imperative that he contributes. Uh, to the to the to the run in because he was brought he was brought in for a reason he wasn't brought in for next season I mean surely the thinking was that he was coming in because they knew Abada was going to go so this guy's you know ready to step in and play or should be ready to step in and play so hopefully he does yeah I absolutely agree with that um, I'll be having a wee chat be before we go about St Johnston and what's coming up JP but there's one or two other points I think that. Um, we should cover, and I'm going to get some comments coming in as well. David Walker spoke to you last night, the Liam Gallagher um, gig, and he plugged his idea for a gym or state of mind. Yeah. What's that? Is that? Rangers, Rangers fan, by the way. Is he? Yeah. Welcome yeah. to the show, David. Welcome to the show. Yeah, what is he was next door to my mate Nathan in Armadale, right. which is a uh, uh, well, if you've a ever been Armadale, a stronghold. If you've ever been Armadale around the. Uh, Middle of July, you, you know what Armadale is, put it that way. <laughs> um, quite something, quite something. Uh, I remember, in fact, speaking of that, Nathan, the guy that he lives next door to, I went to school with, I'll never forget his wee brother 
um, Paul was getting an award for his under 10s or under 12s, I forget what football team he was playing for at the time, what age group, but he was a wee guy. And the ceremony was taking place in Armadale Rangers Supporters Club. And uh, obviously a place I hadn't been before <laughs> and have never been back since. But like you walk, walked in, walked up the staircase and there's like framed pictures of uh, everybody, the Queen at the top of the stairs or whatever. And we were in this room and obviously there was like just the usual clientele that are sitting at the bar and stuff. And Paul comes running up to me shouting, John Paul, John Paul. And I'm like that. No, <laughs> like, a couple of guys turned round, and I'm just like, oh, Paul, call me the John. Pool ball, the pool ball stops on the table. <laughs> like that scene so, in American Werewolf in London, absolutely. Yeah, exactly like that. So, uh, no, that's 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 our deal. But, um, no, he, he loves, he thinks Jim Moore's great. Uh, oh, brilliant. Um, likes his pattern, thinks there should be a Jim Moore state of mind. That's what he said last night. We should do that. We should get Des Gale. Uh, Des Gale. <laughs> Dave McLean, that was a flashback for the past. Mm-hmm. Des, Gail, if you are watching, I uh, hope you're all right. Des McLean uh, to do the funnies on it. Paul McLean, superstition subs. You're the same guy that said that I need to go away with my 20th century views. Superstition. So you would stand on a beetle and walk under a, a, a ladder, would you? I would. I salute, I salute two magpies. Uh, or not. I, no, I don't salute two magpies. I salute one. And then, uh, you know, if you see two, then that's fine. But if you see one, you need to salute it. I just salute them, regardless if they're if they're in mass or if they're singular. I salute a magpie. Good morning, and, Mr. Magpie. How's the lady wife? That's the. I, I know everybody's looking at you as if you've lost the plot. If I see one magpie on the day of a Celtic game, I'm running around looking for a second one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not getting on a bus or a train or whatever until I see that second magpie because it's that's that's how superstitious I am. Just with that, I mean, I don't have many of them, but like that, there's that's the magpie ones are. It's got me as well. A decent song for Stevie Wonder as well. David, Rangers winning means two extra games. That, that's right tonight. Uh, dropping the, the we fell off at school this morning. That's exactly the conversation I was having. Uh, never in my life have I wanted Rangers to win a game. Um, but in terms of progressing in Europe, if they get another couple of games, does it benefit Celtic? A lot of people say, ah, who cares about them? We just need to do our talking on the park. Margins. Fine, fine margins, JP. Um, the loss of a player like Yang, who's just coming into form, margins. These, these things do affect what happens. And I think that if you play extra games, you pick up other injuries, the fatigue sets in, it will affect the other team. I'll keep one eye on that game tonight. Paddy John Hughes, classic top in the background. Absolutely agree with that. Um, who do you think of Paddy when you see that jersey? Who do you think of? There's a few players bringing to mind. You've already mentioned Peyton, so that's in my mind. That was also the jersey that McAvenny wore when he came back for his second spell at Celtic. Um, players like Mike Galloway wore that jersey. I think Stuart Gray made his debut around about that time in that jersey. Certainly played for the reserves wearing it. Smell the glove. The Rangers seem to feed on the momentum of winning in Europe. See, there's another way to look at it. They go and get a good performance tonight, JP, and the momentum helps them in the domestic games. I think there's two sides of that argument. Ridiculizer. Ridiculise that. Mark my words, the growing trend of limiting visiting fans is part of a wider agenda to implement 15-minute prison cities. If you consider yourself a rebel in any way, keep your eyes open to it. Well, Ridiculise uh, we have had somebody on claiming that dinosaurs don't exist. So, you know, we've already broken the back of any kind of conspiracy that you may have in relation to decisions that are being made. Yesterday was the birthday of a certain John Clark, J.P., and I've seen that bit of footage that I've loved since the Celtic Centenary video was released, right? Uh, you remember that brilliant Centenary video? It'll be up there somewhere in amongst my tack, my Celtic tack. I've and, watched it on YouTube. It's on and, YouTube. Is it? Is it? Thanks, brilliant. Man. Michael Vanny narrates it, right? And Billy Conley's on it and all that. But there's a game against Racing Club, which it was the, the game that football died of shame. I remember it being spoken about in the Playing for Celtic books. And John Clark gets the dukes up as if he's going to fight the guy, right? And I shared it yesterday. It was a brilliant bit of footage. And the big Argentinian, who's about two heads bigger than Clark, bottled it. His bottle crashed, the hands went up, and it was the proper Homer Simpson back into the, the hedge moment. Uh, John Clark, the ultimate sell, totally understated, isn't he? Still at the club. A legend. What a, what a song to come out of that as well. The song from that game. 
the Glasgow Celtic. Uh, how can I not remember it? Champions of Europe in racing of Argentina. You know, one, two, three, one, two, and then kick. Cha, cha, cha. You know the one. There's a great T-shirt actually um, that was shared yesterday. I think it's a pile of yours that do, do, does the Celtic T-shirts. An artist. I'm sure it's a pile of yours. Oh, it's, no, it's um, oh God, I can't remember his name. It's something like A Celtic AC, or something. AC. AC Celtic, maybe. Yeah. It's the one that I got the the people's top with Paul McStay on it. With, that's it. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. That guy. I can't, I can't so believe it. He had the name. lyrics, the lyrics of the song, and there was, uh, I think it was Tony Gemmell, John Clark, and Bertie on, on the t shirt. So check no, when, that. You hear, when you hear Henrik Larson and the way that he speaks about him, that's that's all you kind of need to know. Like They've got that special relationship and the amount of FX Celtic players as well that just always, always talk about him. Like that, that he's the guy that they mention, and in much the same way that people mention Neely Mocking, like you, you right. said, aye, they're spot on. And you know what else though, right? You, you mentioned Larson. Um, Larson was blown away that a European Cup winner used to prepare the kit. He, he mm -hmm. spoke about that, didn't he? There was mm -hmm. this guy walking about with the white hair, like you say, right? It's like a different generation, but he's like the Neely Mocking of Celtic Park. This old mm -hmm. guy, honest human. Um, You've got all these guys coming from all over the world who don't really know the history of Celtic. And then some of the homegrown guys are having to explain, this is John Clark. He won the European Cup. And Larson's mm -hmm. going, why is he Why is he preparing my kit? Why is he preparing my boots? You know, the humble, the humility of the man. Um, but on the flip side, somebody who's not as well revered by Celtic fans is John Barnes. And John Barnes spoke about the only sanctuary at Celtic Park being John Clark's room. And whenever he was feeling the pressure and the stress and all this kind of stuff, he would go into John Clark's room, sit with John, John would get the tea on, and that was the only place that he felt that he could actually escape GP. Mm. Unbelievable. And there'll be loads of stories that we're unaware of. People talking about uh, John Clark in such uh, kind of revered tones. Now, we Jinky, it was the anniversary, on the same day as John Clark's birthday, it was the anniversary of Jinky's passing. Um, and the reason I'm bringing that up, you, you might have noticed there's a bit of... Um, Furore around uh, the Jimmy Johnston Academy and Charitable Trust have been based at Catherine Park for 15 years. And in that time, there's a great figure if you go down to Catherine Park and, and have a look inside the actual pavilion. It's like um, a waxworks with a pulse, to quote a famous uh, movie. You go in there and the history of Catherine, you walk around it and it tells you all the figures. But what the Jimmy Johnston have done is they've, they've actually shown you how many footballers have that youth, young grassroots footballers have played on that park since they went in uh, 15 years ago uh, and, and started looking after the place. And I, I'm talking tens of thousands of footballers have played on that park in that, that period of time. Uh, the academy themselves have um, had footballers who have gone professional, they've gone senior, and at the last count, I think it was 38, they're not quite at 40. Who have actually gone through the academy and made it as a footballer for various teams. Some of the names that uh, Celtic fans will remember: Tony Watt, prior to going to Airdrie, uh, was at the, the, the Jimmy Johnston. Uh, Darnell Fisher, who won three league titles with Celtic, ended up going down south and had a really good career down there. Just retired last season, actually through injury. Um, he was uh, Darnell Jimmy... Fisher just retired. I bad knees. Bad news. His oh, last club, I think, was uh, Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough. Can he have been that old? Like, I think he was thirty, JP. I think he was thirty. Yeah, yeah maybe early thirties. But um, yeah. he started off at the academy, and uh, Dembele's brother. Remember Dembele's brother who went down south. He was at those. But as I say, thirty-eight players who have gone through. Anyway, there's there's opposition to the fact that for many many years they've had to put up with uh, the park being used. For the usual um, practice of dog fouling, people having barbecues, having carryouts, broken glass, worse. Um, but one of the worst aspects is turning up for a game and somebody has actually driven their car and, and deliberately skidded all over the park, making it unplayable. So the kids then at the weekend go to play football, can't, they can't play football. So to mm. protect the playing surface, not the entire footprint of Catherine Park, the playing surface, they applied for planning permission to get a fence. Now, down the bottom of my road is a place called Petrivi, right, which is where for years Dunfermline Athletic used to train down there. There are loads of kids. There's 1,500 kids play down there on a Sunday. 
Um, and certain parts of the park are fenced off to protect it from all these things that I've just mentioned. So you're protecting the park for uh, grassroots football, for the, the future of Scottish football, for generations to come. Yet, there are people opposing this. And Frankie Boyle he weighed into it. Now, I'm going to have to say this for anybody who maybe is a, a Glasgow Times um, employee. It seems as though the Glasgow Times are uh, reporting this from one angle, JP. They, they seem to think that this is a Celtic thing because Jimmy Johnson obviously represented Celtic. Some of the players I've mentioned there in the 38 went on to play for Rangers, incidentally. Um, there is no prejudice uh, in respect to who plays at the academy. But uh, Frankie Boyle weighed in with a tweet in relation to that as well. And I just think people are misinformed in relation to uh, what's happening down there. And obviously the people who are volunteers are going down, there's big signs. Um, and obviously the social media narrative as well, JP. And what I would say is I've been doing there this week and I, I've, I've regularly been at Cafton Park and I think it's time that we all got behind their campaign uh, to protect the pitch. That's all they're trying to do. They're not trying to stop anybody's right to roam. They're protecting a football pitch, JP, so that the next generation of footballers can can play without thinking they're going to slide tackle over a broken glass bottle. It just brought to mind was it was it the show where you're talking with Liam Carrigan about the hundred year plan yeah. that they had in Japan? Uh -huh. And did did you or somebody else mention something to do with what was proposed in Scotland? That's right. I with, Jock Brown with, told me about it. It was Craig yeah. Brown's proposal. Yeah. Yeah, to use the money that they'd got from making. France, 98? Or... It was the World Cup. And on the back of the World Cup, they got loads of funding and a massive part of it was from the lottery fund. Mm -hmm. They ended up with 65 million in the pot and they were wondering, what should we do with this, JP? And Craig Brown proposed that they basically had, within a, a radius, of, wherever you were in Scotland, you could go and play a football game on an all-weather pitch, free of charge, with floodlights, mm -hmm. you know. And, and he saw it as a forward-thinking um, mechanism. It seems pretty basic, but it was knocked back. The SFA ploughed all the money into Hamden instead. And and that we, the that result of that good. is we've, we've never been back. We've never <laughs> been back to the World Cup. But, you know, it, I think that, you know, Axom over the years, we're now seven years old. And the community that's been built up has been astonishing. Uh, the amount of people that tune in every single day, the avatars, the names, you recognise them. You bump into them like you did last night, <laughs> albeit not a Celtic fan. You start to get to know these people and then when something, you know, comes to you with regards to, like, we Jamie Tierney, his family needs help, he's a wee Celtic, it doesn't matter what football team he supports, actually, but he needs your help, and we all come together and we raise money for, for something like that. We, we raise money for St Mary's to the point where let's you know, beat around the bush. If that 30 grand had not been raised by Celtic fans on this platform, that tra chapel was in dire straits at that time. The club didn't go and give them a, a cheque for 30 grand JP. It was the Celtic fans that raised the money. So every now and again, I think people need us to back them. And I think that's where we are with the Captain Park situation at the moment. So yeah. um, I, I keep an eye on it. We'll be sharing it. We'll be blogging about it. We'll be talking about it on this platform. And we're right behind the Jimmy Johnson Academy and Charitable Trust. Don't forget, it's also a charitable trust. They are helping people in the community massively. Um, on a daily basis, JP. And, you know, some people might not know this is ongoing. You know, it could be under the radar. So we're, we're trying mm. to shine a light on it. Totally. No, it's, somebody has to, if you're getting mixed messages and mixed reports in the media, then, yeah, somebody has to, to be honest about it. All I would say is read between the lines. Why are people opposing it? What is the motivation between the opposition? I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. So we're going to be backing them to the absolute hill. Uh, JP and as I say I went down there on Tuesday uh, spoke to uh, Jim and the guys down there, brilliant, always welcomed uh, just, you know if you're passing go and chat at the door and ask for a wee look around the pavilion, you will not be disappointed, it's an incredible place um, I've got to thank everybody, give me a wee prediction for the weekend JP, are we going to keep this uh, show on the road are we going to get back to a free scoring, never boring squad uh -huh. Celtic, are well, we going to get back to that? I mean you like to think so. I mean, uh, you never want to get ahead of yourself and go, oh, it's only St. Johnson at home. St. Johnson have already taken a point from Celtic Park <laughs> uh, earlier in the season. So you definitely need to be mindful of that. But hopefully they uh, have analysed that performance and uh, 
I targeted what we need to do differently because those those draws have hurt us and uh, the, the draws at home have hurt us um, massively because of games that you would have expected to win so we're expected to win this but we need to go out and do it and I just hope that I just hope that they have got the confidence that they still had in the Dundee game to know that they can go and do that to a team regardless of their position in the league um, so I, I, I'm looking forward to it um, just looking forward to all the games if you know, hopefully get a ticket for Livingston. As usual, they give us the three stands. So, which is admittedly a little bit overkill. I think you know when people sort of get on about us for wanting tickets for away games, you don't normally expect to get three quarters of a stadium. But when you see the attendances that Livingston are getting against, like I saw, they played midweek the same night we played Dundee, and they played at home. I think and the stadium was empty. So yeah. no wonder they're taking the opportunity to to get as much out of us as they can when when they can. Um, it's just annoying when you <laughs> when you're now hearing that Hibs are reducing the allocation and add add that to Hearts, add that to Aberdeen. It's, it's getting close to sort of pretty much half the league has has sort of shut us out or or, or want to shut us out. Um, versus a time when we used to get hog stands or whatever and it's just like you're just supposed to go oh well okay so that's it then i mean that it's now uh six years since i was at ibrox six years like that's wild i know that covid's been in there yeah. but that's this six years since the edward game because the anniversary was was recently it was the other day i'm sure got a few notifications of of uh you normally, memories. Get, you normally get a low z video don't you? Yeah, so, yeah. I had, I had a few of my own because obviously I'd uh, enjoyed that quite a lot. So I think I'd posted about it or whatever. So, but yeah, six years. And now you're at, 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 at the point when, well, when will I go to Tyne Castle again? When will I go to Easter Road again? Is that just, that's, that's it. I just can't go now. <laughs> Went all my life. Pretty much usually averaged to visit there, to visit to Edinburgh once or twice a season I mean mm -hmm. used to get tickets all right for Tyne Castle you'd get that full stand so it was tricky but it wasn't Mission Impossible and Easter Road as well was, was a gettable ticket when you had the full stand but not anymore It makes me wonder in Europe let's say um, if a similar scenario exists is it just Scottish football um, as I say Scottish football will eat itself uh, eventually was that my 20th century view I don't know uh, let us know in the con uh, comments section, Paul. But St. Johnson, yeah, I think against St. Johnson, what I would like to see, again, I said it a few weeks ago and it worked against Dundee. Get the shackles off, JP. Play with two up top. I don't. I know we didn't do that against Dundee, but play with two up front. Play Ida and Kyogo. Find a way to do that. Um, play a high enough line that it gets to the point where, you know, I've, I've kind of been watching all week the, the clips from the game of Welsh and Scales. Now slowly are getting the ball out from the back. Um, you know, you used to have that urgency of, of a ball carrier um, from the central defensive area. And this season, what I would say about Nabrowski, I liked the way that he um, hit the wings and also would, would not be scared to hit Kyogo over the top. Mm -hmm. It's not a high hopeful ball. He can see the run and he's playing the ball. We're not doing enough of that. We're not cutting through from the back. And then you look at the midfield. Um, people have been criticising O'Reilly. I'm putting a lot of it down to fatigue. I think he is carrying the weight of some of the others around about him. I think that, that the fact that McGregor's not playing as well doesn't help that. And if you're playing with defensive uh, midfielders there against St. Johnston at home, come on, let's attack them. You know, let's, let's, Coons on form, let's play Maeda's on form on the wing. Play the type of balls they were playing in the first hour of the game. Continue that with Kyogo in the park and we are going to be cutting them to pieces. I think... If you were to do that, JP, we, we could get a comfortable victory against St. Johnson rather than you're 25 minutes in and we're passing the ball about and Scales and Welsh have passed the ball to each other 100 times. We can't do that. We, we cannot approach games like that now. No, definitely not. And on Matt O'Reilly, somebody said, I think it was Alan Morrison, had said that he's played 22 games and he's played the full 90 minutes like in a row. And, and he's, also been, yeah. he's also ah, he's also been ill for the last two weeks as well. Like the night before the Hearts game, he, he went to his bed at eight o'clock and woke up at midnight and then didn't get back to sleep ahead of that Hearts game. So 
I know what that's like when you kind of get to sleep um, before working a gig or something like that, but to then have to play a game of football and an early kickoff. It's physical um, and mental fatigue. And You're play with 10 men for, the, for pretty much the whole game as well. So, I know, I know. And then line up and start again because we're in a situation at the moment, JP, where you can't drop them. This, no. is, this is the problem. Now, I was talking about that slow language style, scales on wheels, far too slow. Far too slow getting the ball moved and, and transitioned from defence to attack. The wingers haven't helped this season, but they look better at the weekend. And then in the defence, you've got Matt O'Reilly. But behind Matt O'Reilly, you had a Wata, who takes far too uh, much time on the ball, um, needs to be quicker in, in transition and that. And you've got Bernardo and the Alan Morrison stat that absolutely blows my mind is that he plays less forward passes than Joe Hart. He plays mm-hmm. the ball sideways and backways. Now, that is not what we need. We need the midfielders to be cutting through, finding pockets of space, um, identifying the runs of a player like Kyogo, making sure that any overlap by the fullback or the winger is being noticed, and obviously we can capitalise on it. If we line up uh, and it's too predictable and it's too safe at the weekend, JP, I just think that this time to click is now we can't regress back to that that style of play. Brendan Rodgers done it in his first kind of tenure at Celtic. He played with a one up top, didn't he? Um, mm. You think to yourself, sometimes just you know, let the shackles off. Let's play. We're, we've got better quality players up the tempo, and we can dismantle a team like this. Joseph McGonagall, yeah, eighteen years feels like yesterday. It was eighteen years yesterday since the greatest ever sell, as voted for by the Celtic supporters, Jimmy Johnston passed away um, due to motor neuron disease. And we will continue to promote the Academy and Charitable Trust that um, is in his name with his blessing and his family's blessing. Jimmy Johnson was involved um, in the decision-making process in the early days of the Jimmy Johnson Academy. So let's not forget that. Let's get behind them. I think uh, every now and again, some people need your support. And I think this the time is now. JP, someone points out there, by the way, uh, 30 grand a week, I think it was Ian Roy. Yeah, 30 grand a week um, is like a, a week's wage to a lot of footballers. Yeah, it is. And it took us a long time and loads of effort and support from Celtic fans to raise that. But raise it, we did. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. What else are we up to at the moment? Well, um, Paddy McCourt is coming to, to Glasgow. He's coming to Gracie's. Um, and a few people uh, messaged me to say, you know, with regards to what's happened with Paddy over the last couple of years, please have a look at what happened with Paddy's case because Paddy is now coming back into the fold as an ex-Celtic player, absolutely cleared of um, an accusation, a false accusation that was made against him. It could happen to anybody, but thankfully Paddy went to court and he was absolutely cleared. He's getting on with his life. He's a Derry Pelly. He's a cult legend. Come and see us at Gracie's. Ticket link underneath the video. JP could talk to you forever. We'll probably do that after we go off live and we'll talk a wee bit about last night. But thank you very much for joining us and join us again at 12.30 on a Celtic State of Mind. Cheers, Paul.